let me turn to Dr. Paul Sullivan, one of our favorite international affairs fellows. You'll see the reason momentarily. Why, thank you, John Duke. Uh, think of yourself as living in the time before the automobile, before electricity, before gasoline, before nuclear power, before even a heavy use of coal, and try to predict what's going to happen next. Nearly impossible, and yet today people are predicting what will happen in 2050, 2060, and 2070 for energy. And also when you have an energy transition, just looking at the transition, moving from one fuel to another is not enough because other things are moving at the same time. Technologies are moving, transportation is moving, communication is moving, government is moving. But also you have to keep an eye on the other things that are happening that it can affect your economic security, <clears throat> your energy security, food security, national security, human security, reliability and resilience of all of those as well. It's uh, something that is very fluid and changeable. And this is a good quote from Churchill, the further backward you look, the further forward you can see. Take a look at this chart. My guess is not many of you have seen this in the audience. World GDP per capita, all along, poverty, 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 going nowhere. We start in with the Industrial Revolution, and it takes off exponentially. World population, the same thing. We're bouncing around. Well, not exactly the same thing, a little bit different. We grow here. We get to the improvements of uh, medical services and drugs and antibiotics and, and medical sciences, and everything takes off. In 1800, there were less than a billion people. Now there is 7.7 .7 billion. This is a period of acceleration. Now, if we put this all together with atmospheric CO2, we can see that everything was increasing in an accelerated manner. This one here, can you see my cursor? This one here around 1500, 1600, when the CO2 went down and the temperatures went down, that's called the Little Ice Age. And that started when 60 million people who used to live in the Americas became 6 million through disease and conquests and so forth. But as we can see here, something's going on. And this really explains why we're having this next transition. It's not about technology change driving. It's not about what happened before increase in population driving it or accelerating increase in population, accelerating needs for energy or the push from inventions as they were happening. This next transition <coughs> is being driven by externalities, by pollutants, by CO2, by the greenhouse effect. What happened here? Oh, God. Oh, we're back. All right. I don't know how that happened. All right. If we're taking a look at the history of energy, coal and hydrocarbons, oil is a tiny blip. It's a tiny blip, but it's a quick blip. It's an explosive blip. It almost looks like the coronavirus cases in the United States in the last few weeks. Could anyone have expected that? Could anyone have predicted that? For years and years and centuries, millennia, we used biomass fuel, wood, cow dung, and so forth. And then we started to use coal, and then we went into hydrocarbons. Charcoal was there all along, but not a big chunk of it. Now, this is an interesting one for us to look forward. This is the growth of oil, gas, and coal over a relatively short period of time. Look at how it grew exponentially, fantastically, amazingly. Look at how oil came from almost nothing. Titusville, Pennsylvania, oil city. Pennsylvania used to be the center of the oil business. And then we have the uh, countries outside. We have Russia, we have near Baku. And then we move into the Middle East on about the same time and later with Iran, with uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. And 
right now, why this is important for the Middle East and North Africa is a lot of this growth in oil and gas help them grow as countries, as states, as people. Look back in 1971 in the UAE. Where were they? Oil and gas got them to grow and develop. Dubai would not be what it is without that. Saudi Arabia, uh, before the discovery of oil, the king's treasury was in one camel bag and it was extremely poor. And the king was talking with uh, Kim Philby's dad and a, and a sapper from New Zealand when they wanted to find oil. He said, what do I need with oil? Find me water, I need water. So look at all these changes. Within these changes, the Middle East and North Africa grew with it. And if they weren't an oil exporter, they were a people exporter in North Africa or the Palestinians. So turning this whole thing around would be turning around a lot of what is needed. Also during that time, there were lots of technology changes, new inventions that came along with the energy change, the steam engine, the electric motor, the vacuum tube, which is now semiconductors, television, nuclear energy, the microchip, and then the internet. All of this could never have happened without energy change and particularly the, the great inventions and transitions that happened because of electricity. We barely knew what electricity was in the early 18th century. We'd look up in the sky and we'd see lightning. We had no idea to capture it, no idea to store it. It took until the end of the 19th century for people to figure <laughs> out how to make batteries. And now look what we're doing. We're thinking about making an entirely electrified world. I feel that's problematic. Also, within all of these new technologies that were being developed within oil and, and gas, gigantic value and supply chains that were put on the ground. How do we turn this around? I don't know what the total value is of these supply chains on the ground worldwide. I would say it's multiple trillions. How are we going to shut these down or convert them to other uses by the time period that people think this is going to happen? People are just way too optimistic about how quickly this transition is going to happen. Just look at what happened recently. Uh, the price shocks in Europe, the gas, the electricity price shocks, the oil shocks, both up and down. As we move in a transition, if we move too quickly, we could shatter the world economy. We have to be very careful in doing this. But oil is not going to disappear. Oil will be around because there are products that use oil. Uh, those of you who like vanilla ice cream that use uh, non-natural flavorings, it comes from petroleum. Sorry, folks. You need to get the vanilla bean to get the real flavor without the petrol in it. Toothpaste, cosmetics, lotions, preservatives. When you had your cereal this morning, there was a little bit of crude oil in there. Well, refined crude oil. If you like uh, nylon, polyester, anything but pure cotton, but making pure cotton shirts requires oil golf balls for the golfers out there. There will still be demand for oil. Common uses for oil, thousands of them. Anyone who has little kids who use crayons? Well, we can thank the Saudis and others for the petroleum that went into that, but also the oil producers in the shale fields in our own country. Insecticides, fertilizers, pesticides, shower curtains, roofing. Tens of thousands of things use oil. Natural gas supply chains are gigantic in the world. If anyone's been to Qatar, think of the hundreds of billions of dollars that are on the ground to make sure that those LNG facilities are working properly. I visited the Chenier facility as they were building it from the ground up down at Sabine Pass, $37 billion for a start off fee. How are we going to turn this around? Many people think natural gas is a bridge fuel for the transition. Natural gas uses or produces much less CO2, much less emissions overall uh, than coal, certainly. Uh, it could be from one fourth to one sixth, depending on what type of coal we're talking about. And uses, it produces, sorry, less emissions and less pollutants, certainly, than oil. So natural gas could be 
one of these bridge fuels, but also natural gas is used for siding, pipes, flooring, solvents, metal cleaning, dry cleaning, toothpaste, cosmetics, foods, carpets, clothing, bottles, and for the production of hydrogen and ammonia. This is part of the transition too. And methanol. A lot of things can come out of natural gas. Now, these are the CO2 emissions that go along with that quickly rising chart of fuel uses. You don't see much CO2 emissions from solar. You don't see them from nuclear because nuclear actually produces less CO2 per megawatt than just about any other source of energy. If you look at the entire supply chain and through the life cycle of the technology, nuclear is way down there. And why people are disparaging it as non-green, I don't understand. Look at coal, look at oil, look at gas. This is what's driving COP26, COP27 in Egypt, COP1, the Paris Accord, all of this stuff. This stuff is piling into the atmosphere. It's piling into the oceans that are absorbing this. It's piling into plants that are absorbing this. And there's a big drive for an energy transition because of what this is doing. Now, if we're looking in the future, the population is not going to grow like in the past. It won't be a driver for invention, for innovation, much like it was in the past. The biggest changes in population in the past were India and China. China has slowed down. India is slowing down. The population line, if you want to take a look at it, is this top one here, the, that gray one at the top. Rest of the world, when you add all of these lines together, this is what you get for population. So by 2050, our population is going to be close to 9.7 billion people. We are now at about seven and a half, 7.7. .7. Who knows? Nobody really does a, a full census in a place like India. I saw one of those census happening when I was living there in the 1980s. It had nothing to do with what you saw on the ground. Maybe it's changed certainly over the years. But look at the population growth. Where do you expect most of it to happen? In Africa, China is going to flatten out. India, people expect it to flatten out. But the GDP is going to continue to grow. This is the red line. This is, could be a driver for these energy transitions. But what these energy transitions could do is knock that GDP chart down. If we move too quickly, we keep on getting these energy shocks, energy price shocks, oil shocks, uh, energy shortages because we're moving too quickly and we're not thinking this through, we could impoverish many countries. We have to be extremely careful with this. Now, I know a lot of people in the Middle East, in the GCC, in OPEC, uh, probably think that we shouldn't be that worried about climate change. Well, those of you who are listening from Saudi Arabia, I suggest you read the King's speech from last week which was dominated with a discussion about climate change. He's getting it. MBS is getting it. The Saudi people are starting to get it. The Emirates had it a long time ago. They started to move toward nuclear, moving towards solar, moving toward ammonia, moving toward renewables. Uh, the, their energy minister gave a talk in my class last year. He was very clear where they're headed. And it's not toward the past, toward the future. Kuwait is not moving as quickly toward that future as Saudi Arabia and the UAE are. Uh, Bahrain will follow Saudi on this. Uh, the Qataris have been moving forward with some uh, renewable energy for a very long time, but it's still all of these things. If you took a look at the charts, if anyone wants to look at them, I have them all at the end of this, this PowerPoint presentation. I have all the energy charts and Sankey diagrams for most of the countries in OPEC and the Middle East and North Africa, all of them are dominated by oil and natural gas, and they're moving very slowly. But MBS and others in the region, including the uh, leadership of UAE, want to move quickly toward a transition. Saudi Arabia is thinking about 2060, uh, the UAE 2050. Uh, many countries in the region will follow Saudi Arabia and the UAE toward 2050, 2060. From my experience in the energy industry that goes back to 1985, I can tell you right now, 2060 and 2070 
is very optimistic. There will be lots of shocks along the way, lots of disturbances. Now, this is what the Energy Information or the International Energy Agency is looking at for a change in fuel use. Oil goes way down, but it doesn't disappear. Coal goes way down, it almost disappears. But the strange thing about coal, people are talking about getting rid of coal, but at the same time, the Chinese, the Indonesians, and the, even the Vietnamese are building more coal plants. The Germans are using more coal. It's bizarre. Uh, China says that they're gonna be there by 2070 with this big transition. And yet at the same time, they're increasing coal output, but at the same time, they're building a bunch of solar panel stations and dozens of nuclear power plants. Natural gas will stay pretty high, but it will decline as well. Look at nuclear, this should be much bigger. But the Energy Information Agency, this is their forecast. Predicting an energy is bizarre. You can't do it. I think they're all fooling themselves in many different ways. Because if you were sitting back, going to the beginning of my talk, if you were sitting back at the time of Ben Franklin, when he's just figuring out a little bit about electricity, could you describe the energy system we have today and that the Middle East and North Africa would be so important in it? Absolutely no. Because this transition involves not just energy and technologies associated with those, but economies and peoples and societies and the post-COVID revolution that might happen. I am convinced after COVID, there will be extreme uncertainty in many parts of the world and extreme instability. The people will finally have it sink in what happened. What's that going to do to all of this? Net emissions per sector, look at how electricity goes down so quickly. That's this blue line here. How is that going to happen? Well, according to the IEA, we're gonna move away from coal, natural gas, and oil. Yes, many countries use oil for electricity. We don't since uh, Nixon made it illegal to make in a, a coal uh, an oil generating station. Buildings should go down, more efficient uh, air conditioning. Transportation, the electrification of transportation will bring CO2 down to net zero. At least that's the, that's the goal. <coughs> but I'll tell you one thing, the idea of, uh, uh, entire electric uh, transportation systems makes me nervous as a person who worked for the military for over 22 years. Uh, if there are any people in the military listening in, think about, think about having a war in the Baltics with all electric military vehicles and the Russians hacking them or hacking the battery system or hacking, you have to have diversification. One thing that's missing in all of these forecasts is the required diversification based on the conditionalities that will happen over time. And it will be huge. Industry will reduce. It can move away from, uh, well, for example, one a very interesting example is, is an aluminum plant in Iceland uses all geothermal. And they have the cheapest aluminum prices in all of Europe. So you have all kinds of beer companies like uh, Heineken and so forth buying their cans from the Icelandics. Go figure. You can make steel cheaper with geothermal if you set it up right. What's going to happen over time, probably for according to the IEA, this is what they're looking at. It's going to be something more extended. It's not going to be a straight, nice line. It's going to be bouncing all over the place. It's going to be jagged. It's going to be unpredictable. And I'm pretty sure they know this. Another part of what's going to cause the changes, and John Kerry and others pointed this out, is there's going to be a lot of technology change along the way between now and 2070. Things that we don't even know about yet. We can't even guess about yet. And many of these might come out of the Middle East and North Africa. With the changes <coughs> that are happening in Saudi Arabia and the money being poured into that, this is the time to develop education in energy and in energy technology and invention in that part of the world and bring back the inventiveness of the Middle East and North Africa. There's no reason why they cannot do that. And one thing that will help drive this inventiveness and innovation is the easy money of the roller coaster of oil revenues will not be there for them. They'll be pushed 
to be inventive. They were already being inventive in many things. One thing sharpens the mind, one could say the guillotine, thinking of the French Revolution. Another thing that sharpens the mind can be heading toward poverty, having difficult economic times. This can cause it. CO2 capture is going to be part of it. The Saudis are looking into this. The UAE is looking into this. Egypt is looking into it. We're looking into this. We can capture that carbon from every single fuel source put it into the ground and use it. We can reuse stuff. And the whole point of this, and this is sort of my pet thing that I've attached with for some time, when it comes to where the Middle East and North Africa and the rest of the world should go to solve not only the energy problem, but also the environment problem and the climate problem. You reuse things. You reduce things and you recycle things. You turn companies, houses, areas, com countries into circular economies. What are we doing right now? We buy a cell phone, it breaks down, we toss it out. If that could be reused, all of that material could be reused. What are we doing now with the CO2 being pumped out of coal generating stations? We're putting it right into the atmosphere. Wrong way of looking at things. You could use that CO2, no kidding, to create building materials, to create cleaning materials, to create new energy. Also, if you're looking at uh, electricity production through something like nuclear, you create a lot of heat. There's a lot of heat in a coal generating station, a nuclear generating station. Where does the heat go? The heat goes to evaporating water, to waste the water, and to send less heat into the atmosphere. We waste close to 68% of all the fuel we put into our system. And a lot of that waste goes out as waste heat. Waste heat. Now, all you had to do, for example, inside that nuclear station is capture that waste heat and put it into another electricity station and create electricity from the waste heat or to dry crops or to run greenhouses or to do a million other things with chemicals and other processes with this heat that we just sent into the atmosphere as waste. Think of all the coal that has gone into coal generation that has gone up in the air as heat that is never used again. Absolutely wasteful. Also with some of the biofuels that we're using, bad idea because they use a lot of water, many of them, uh, you can use the waste from agriculture instead of just throwing out or burning it, which can pollute in the atmosphere. You can put it into anaerobic digestion tanks. The Saudis are thinking about waste energy. The Emiratis already have one. The Emiratis and the Saudis are looking into geothermal. Many countries are looking into this system too. And I'll give you a more specific example that may be better to understand if you're an energy person. This is the a circular carbon network framework of Saudi Arabia. This is through Aramco, through MBS, through King Salman. They're serious about this. So let's not kid ourselves. The energy transition will be happening in Saudi Arabia. It's already happening there. It's already happening in the Emirates. It's already happening in Qatar. Uh, Kuwait will pick up on this. Uh, the Egyptians are looking at solar and wind big time on the coastlines. They have lots of wind and solar energy potential. Reduce it. Combined cycle gas turbine is like what I was telling you about. You don't waste that heat. You use that heat to make more electricity. Uh, you have better uh, air conditioning. The biggest source or draw on energy for electricity in the Middle East is air conditioning. Air conditioning. 70% of the household use of electricity is air conditioning. We can change those standards. Then use renewable, solar, wind, and biogas. Low carbon fuels, hydrogen, nuclear, and ammonia that goes along with the hydrogen. You can use carbon and polymers, methanol, oil recovery, you could capture the carbon, 
You could use carbon sinks. This has a lot to do with the Saudi Green Initiative. Uh, they put down, they got thinking about putting down billions of trees. This can absorb the carbon. The mangroves in the UAE can absorb carbon. You can mineralize it and turn it into useful things. I think that's all I want to say today. And uh, I'm awaiting questions from people in the audience.